bless you. Happy seats. It's uh, again great to be in the house and uh, certainly glad to see also Lady Sharice in the building. Clap it up for her, everybody. Um, so I'm gonna uh, attempt to continue part two of this message that I preached earlier this week while we were at the Proctor Conference and it was a blessing to be there with a number of folks from our church and all across the country uh, as a way to keep thinking about our unique call as a church, uh, particularly in this moment as we wrap up our uh, Black History Month. Uh, I think it's apropos uh, for us to be reminding ourselves that we are all uh, a part of a history, or dare I say histories, and that the world did not start when you got here. I'll tell your neighbor, amen, the world didn't start when you got here. I know you very important and significant. <laughs> Amen. I know it may feel that way, that uh, when you arrived, uh, you know, it, it just started from scratch. But how many of you know that you are a product of somebody's prayers, Hallelujah. somebody's activity, that we all stand on the shoulders of a people and a, a, a story and certainly uh, a level of faithfulness that should always compel us to think about what is our own responsibility to live out that faithfulness in the same kind of way. The book of Hebrews is thought to have been uh, one of these such passages that is attempting to make uh, this history much more known and concrete for a group of people who are living in and under a age of empire, of vicious government that uh, unleashed violence arbitrarily, persecuted people who were attempting to live their faith out faithfully uh, by the way in which they treated one another, by their public and private confessions, by the ways in which they used their money and built community that, uh, that in the book of Hebrews, the audience is thought to have been attempting uh, to, to, to figure out is this Jesus thing really worth it given the time in which we're living. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you'd be asking yourself, man, is living right really working? Because you know, <laughs> look at these other folk around here. Uh, I, figure out, I, I, I like to get down in the mud with them. <laughs> Amen. Anybody felt like that? Be like, I could be more muddy than you, praise God. I don't know if that's just me. Mm, and so, 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 you know, there is always this, this, this struggle to remain faithful to the ways of Jesus in light of the wickedness around us. There's always a struggle to be faithful to the ways of Jesus in light of the trouble and trial around us. You know, uh, dealing with some of these folk out here, and you know they're schemers, and they're manipulators, and they got a diabolical plan to to do your family, our family, our community harm on your job. You ever met some folk like that? You'd be like, yep. Yeah. I know I said I decided to follow Jesus yesterday, but then I got here on my job. <laughs> Amen. And I meant no turning back when I was at the church house. Amen. But this thing got me looking over my shoulder. So, so all of the ways in which we struggle to follow Jesus faithfully, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32 gives us, I think, some words of uh, challenge and encouragement. So turn your attention to the screen, or you can follow along in your, in your Bibles. Hopefully uh, you see uh, where we are. Uh, I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, I believe, and the, the scripture says, And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, Samuel, and the prophets. All of these, if you read the book of Hebrews chapter 11, this, this whole chapter is called the Hall of Faith. And it's a, just a robust but not exhaustive list of people who have, to the best of their ability, used their faith to persist through trial and tribulation. And so it's good to know, particularly as we move into Black History Month or through it, that there are always people who have not thrown in the towel. Somebody say amen, right? Amen. And, and we are part of that lineage, all right? Verse number 33, who through faith, somebody say through faith, through faith. conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained 
promises, shut the mouths of lions, quench raging fire, escape the edge of the sword. One strength out of weakness became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death, sawn in two, killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, and tormented. And they went through a lot. Verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. Uh, I had to preach all by itself, huh? Amen. I, if I was petty today, I, I'd tell you to tell your neighbor, you don't deserve me. Amen. But I'm not that petty. Amen. We're going keep to it, keep it right. Amen. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, everybody say all these. Oh. All of them, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised. Since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. I'm going to conclude by reading the uh, next verse found in chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses... Let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding the shame and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God, consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be unto God. So we're going to speak for, from the topic, uh, something I started a little bit earlier this week, and we'll finish it up here. Uh, the cloud is watching. The cloud is watching. Bow your heads and let's pray. God, we thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon me and even the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Tell your neighbor the cloud is watching. Amen. Are you awake this morning? Amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, wake up, neighbor, because the cloud is watching. Now, what one of our, our, our biggest challenges about uh, the way in which we will follow Jesus is, whose Jesus will we follow? And here at The Way, I hope we are much more clear about it than elsewhere, because there is always and at all times multiple uh, expressions, multiple descriptions, multiple uh, 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 sects, S-E-C-T-S, of Jesus that often compel our loyalty. Uh, will we follow the Jesus of empire, the Jesus that seems to find very little wrong with violence, hierarchy, imperialism, predatory behavior, and find a way to put some deodorant on that Jesus, some cologne and perfume, and believe that that Jesus is the most faithful expression of Jesus we're called to? Or will we follow the Jesus who, at many points of his life, was deeply vulnerable to the whims and the, the challenges of the state, born to an unwed teenage uh, young girl and found himself on the wrong side of town? unjustly arrested, he was racially profiled, he was executed by the government of his day. How many heard of that Jesus, amen? This Jesus requires something of us that the empire Jesus may not even think to raise for us. 
And I think it's important for you and I to keep appreciating that while we make a description or a decision of Jesus or to follow Jesus, that there's so much at stake for us because there is a level of clarity, I would argue, with the cloud, the ancestors who have gone before us, and they have been and are very clear about the Jesus that they followed. That even in real time, they had to wrestle with a, a, a practice of Christian faith that did not always see their full humanity. Did not always acknowledge their full giftedness. That had at times found a way to erase their particularity, the, the beauty that they were created in the image of God. And yet these folk in the cloud, if you will, our ancestors, those that have come before us, still figured out a way to, to pin some songs and some hymns and some declarations that made this Jesus so real that even some decades and centuries and millennia later, we are still being transformed by this Jesus. And could it be, child of God, that one of our greatest tasks in this moment is to ensure that the Jesus we follow, the Jesus that we embrace, the Jesus that we fashion our lives after is the Jesus that those in the cloud of witnesses will look at us and say, yes, that is a faithful, expanded uh, a trajectory of fellowship, fellowship, dare I say, discipleship, that will transform your and our lives after the image of God. It should be not lost upon us that it is not a guaranteed proposition that everyone is following this Jesus. Uh, you, 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 you ought to be honest about yourself and say, there were at times I thought I was following Jesus and I had to get a revelation and realize that maybe I need to get more in line with the Jesus, the savior of my soul, the, the, the healer and creator of all of the world that, that in many respects I need to ensure that my life is following the ways of Jesus. And what is at stake when you and I don't follow the ways of Jesus? Well, part of what I believe is that we can easily, as a church, be seduced, get caught up, uh, dare I say, have amnesia about the call that we are expected to live into in a world that is at real time Antichrist, anti the ways of peace and healing and hope and abundance. And we can then find ourselves a little bit too late in the game attempting to be faithful and not allow it to follow through. I remember when I was at Duke and I was doing my uh, 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 class on the Rwanda Genocide. And I was so compelled by this class because this class was talking about uh, the, 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 the country of Rwanda that was 90% Christian. And it had two, probably had more than two particular cultural, racial, intra-racial groups uh, in the country, but they mostly broke down along two kind of groups, the Hutus and the Tutsis. How many heard of the Rwanda genocide? A few of you, right? And it's so fascinating as I begin to study the genocide and I begin to see and hear how the tensions between these two socially constructed identities, right? Because if you went back in time, you would find, I think it was the French uh, that came in and they just looked at the features of one of the uh, African uh, tribes and they said, we're going to name you Tutsi. And then they looked at another group, and we're going to name you Hutus, and we're going we're to privilege one group over the other in social status and give you a little bit more access to money and a little bit more access to property. We're going to put you in some political positions. And, and, and for, for a couple of generations, these groups, uh, though they were socially constructed, 
they begin to solidify in the country's social strata because of an external designation. And once the genocide started, there was an uprising of pow Hutu power, they called it. And, and the fascinating thing about the genocide as I studied it is that you had Hutus and Tutsis working together, living together, going to church together. But when the government made a declaration that we should, we want all of the Hutus to kill the Tutsis, that there was a genocide over 100 days where a million Tutsis lost their lives at the hands of the Hutus. And the most despairing thing of this study for me was when they came into the towns after the genocide was over, they came into some churches. And the story goes that the churches became places that were supposed to be refuge for Tutsi families. But some of their Hutu counterparts would load them into churches, lock the doors, and they would burn the churches down with their members, their fellow members in a church because the government had put them at such odds with one another that their anger towards the Tutsis, their fear of being persecuted or dare I say killed themselves if they did not follow through or their own pain allowed them to become complicit in such a diabolical scheme. And the operative question that I had to wrestle with and all of us in the class wrestled with was what was it about the Christian formation or faith in Rwanda that they could not overcome such a command? And you know, it's always easy to look into other contexts, whether it's time or geography, and say, oh, if I was there, I'd do this. But how many of you know we have decisions we make every day about who we will stand with and for and who we will step back and allow the diabolical systems of this world to literally take their lives? It is this kind of witness that I believe as we read in the text, the cloud is watching us because there are many in the cloud of witnesses, as we've read, who through their acts of faith, they were able to not only resist, but this leads to my first point, they were able to resist faithfully or resist with a faith-filled resistance that allowed them, as the scripture says, to topple kingdoms to make justice work, to, to take the promises for themselves, to be protected from lions and fires. All of these kinds of vulnerabilities, their faith that, that was resisting faithfully helped them to stand in the face of adversity. So that's the first thing that I want to lift up to you today, that the cloud is watching us and the cloud is asking us, will we resist faithfully? Somebody holler, resist. Faithfully. Faithfully. Now, it is uh, not a, a mystery that we are living in a time where, for many of us, we are in the resistance. We, we like to describe ourselves as in the resistance, or we feel like we are part of a resistance. But how many of you know that it matters how you resist? That to resist just for the sake of resistance can also push or cause you to become the very thing God is calling us to resist. I don't know if you've ever been a part of something and you got caught up all in the momentum of the thing and then you look around and you realize, oh my goodness, how did I get this far out here in the middle of this place? Because it matters how you and I resist. The scripture, it says it very clearly that their faith, cause them to topple kingdoms, their faith, that, that there is a way of resistance that you and I are tasked to embody, that you can't resist using all or only the tools of the empire, 
of the world that your resistance requires you to get in tune with the power and the tools that God has placed in your hands. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the scripture says that the weapons of our resistance, of our warfare, of our struggle are not of human origin. Which means that there are a set of tools at your disposal that you got to become much more familiar with. Do, do I have anybody that, that can name a couple of these tools that, that in order for you to resist faithfully, you must endure some tools or practices like prayer. How I you know there's a lot of folks out here resisting, but they don't look to anyone other than themselves? to give them the power to resist. But the act of prayer, it decenters your will. And it calls you into a place where you can say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. There are practices like we just came out of a consecration and now we're heading into Lent, another rhythm where you and I can focus on a certain kind of spiritual formation that helps our heart and our mind become a little less self-centered and a little more open to the journey required for not only salvation but resurrection. And so this week, we're going to celebrate Ash Wednesday and head into Lent. And how many of you know that this process of, of, of dis, uh, discipling and, and fasting and, 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 and taking some things from your life that you are, you know, feeling you can't live without? Because how many know there are a lot of things you think you can't live without till you don't have it? Right. <laughs> I wish I could talk to somebody today. Amen. Amen. You thought you couldn't live without this and that. Oh, I don't know what I'd do without my red bottles. Oh, I don't know what I'd do without this. Oh, I don't know what I'd do without my car. I don't know without this job. And then you don't get it. And guess what? You figured out what to do. But could it be that some of these things that you think you cannot live without have become such a crutch for you that they keep you from being able to resist the ways of this world through a faith-filled resistance. So one of the questions I, I, I have for you that I'd love for you to think about is how can you ensure you don't trade in your faith-filled resistance for a faithless resistance? What tools are at your disposal? How many know tools like compassion? Tools like love, tools like joy, and tools like even story and a memory. Because the only way you and I can participate in this fallen world with this level of commitment to the fallen ways is if we don't have a sense of memory, of history. That those who are in the cloud, they're calling out to us and they're saying, don't forget that we resisted all of that that some of you are embracing. I mean, can you imagine if some of these folk in our ancestry did not resist to the point of blood, human hierarchy? They didn't resist all of it because they didn't have maybe enough power to resist all of it, but they resisted what they could. And even the little resistance that they did resulted in them having to pay a price. So our resistance, faith-filled resistance, allows you and I to be able with power and strength to say, I will keep resisting even to the point where the ancestors, the cloud is watching with affirmation. Tell your neighbor, keep resisting, keep resisting, keep resisting. The second thing that I think the scripture lifts up for us is that we must stay together. Somebody holler, stay together. Stay together. Say it again, stay together. stay together. Verse number 39 says, yet all of them, not a few of them, not one of them, not some of them, but all of them. Everybody say all of them. All of them received or, or they did not receive what was promised apart from one another. And in a world and in a time where we are constantly being fragmented and put in places where we oppose one another, we are called as a church and as a people to stay together. 
I was saying earlier in the other service where I was preaching that, you know, when I grew up in San Francisco, you know, we grew up on the Hunters Point side of town. And so, you know, we, we were proudly walking around talking about we HP, we HP. Some folks grew up on the side of town called Sunnydale. And they, you know, they was called kind of the swamp. You know, I don't know if it was a pejorative term, but we certainly called them that, the swamp. And then there were some folks who grew up in Fillmore. And, you know, Hunters Point, Fillmore, Sunnydale, depending on what side of the city you were from, you, if you saw each other on Tight. It was a problem. And then, you know, uh, over here in Oakland, it was East Oakland versus West Oakland. In Berkeley, it was North Oakland versus South Berkeley. Then sometimes it was South Berkeley versus, versus West Berkeley. And then sometimes things got so heavy. If you was out at like Lake Mayor back in the day, the festival at the lake, if you was from Oakland and you saw somebody from San Francisco, then the people from San Francisco would unite with all of our enemies and we would be beefing with the people from Oakland who would unite for all of their enemies. And you realize now that I'm 40 some years old and you look back in the rear view mirror, you're saying, what? was we all fighting about? <laughs> that we can get so fragmented and be at odds with one another and many of us won't even know the reason why. How many of you have ever been a part of somebody else's beef with somebody else? you like, oh, we, 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 we don't rock with them. Oh, okay, yeah, we sure don't. And then after a while, you're sitting there like... They seem pretty cool. I mean, they offered me some water on a hot day. I didn't know, understand. And, 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 and the more you got into the thing, you realize why are we one another's enemies? Child of God, one of our greatest problems is that we and the larger we have to resist our urge to fragment and not stay together. And it is important for you and I to appreciate that none of us will agree on everything. How many know you don't agree with yourself half the time? Amen. It's like what I believe today is not what I believed last week. <laughs> don't have any honest folk out here today. Amen. You, you, thought, you thought this was a non-negotiable until it wasn't. <laughs> Uh huh. And, and, and so you and I cannot allow our disagreements or our dissonance to turn into division where we don't see one another in solidarity with each other. I'm willing to be in solidarity with those who find themselves, as Howard Thurman says, with their backs against the wall, who find themselves struggling the same kind of way to make their ends meet. What does it look like for you and I to realize that our loved ones who are unhoused all through this Bay Area, that we must be in solidarity with them in the best ways that we can, and even some of us will be called to be in solidarity beyond our own capacity at times. What does that look like? Well, sometimes you may have to go into a meeting or do some advocacy that will put some of your own privilege at risk. I remember being in a meeting one time was around some of our young people who are out here shooting folk and, and robbing folk. And, and I had to put my own personal uh, credit on the line. And one of them said, man, you one of these, these hugger thug pastors. I was like, yes, I am. Amen. And, and if you push me, I might just become a thug pastor. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> Forget this hugging stuff, amen. I remember I was in the White House one time and they told me, McBride, if you keep coming here raising the issue of urban gun violence and mass incarceration, you may have your privileges revoked. This is not under this one, it's under the previous one, you know, the, 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 you know the, the one named Barack Obama, praise God. And I told him, well, guess what? You know, if I will get kicked out of the White House for advocating for the people I know and love, at least I'm gonna go out, amen, you know, riding as a rider. I lost sometimes. They did. They said, well, you ain't coming back. And then Ferguson happened, and it was calling me up in Ferguson. Pastor Mike, can you help? Because <laughs> this thing is spreading beyond our control. How many of you know sometimes you may take a loss for being in solidarity with some folk who are marginalized, who don't have a lot of power, but your solidarity and our ability to stay together will always bring us back around to a more place of power and healing and wholeness. 
So tell your neighbor, let's stay together, man. Let's stay together, sis. Let's stay together, my loved one. Don't you dare throw in the towel of relationship and solidarity. So here's a question I want you to think about. Can you practice the art of bridging and belonging? as a way for us to stay together. And we're gonna, we're gonna launch this whole practice of belonging in the next few weeks. Because some of us have to practice belonging to one another. Some of us have to get used to people wanting to belong to us and we wanting to belong to others across our difference. What does it mean for you and I to be people who can bridge and not break? Solidarity, unity requires people who can bridge rather than break. And how many know we are more, hmm, what's the word I'm looking for? We are more wired to break when we disagree than we are to bridge. But how many know through the power of God, we have the power to be bridgers and not breakers. What is that power fueled by? Your love, our love. And our love must be deeper than our divisions, than our differences. And the cloud is watching to see how deep is your love. Is your love shallow to the point where it just takes someone to call you the wrong thing? do uh, something that's out of pocket. It's like, well, I'm done with you. Is your love so shallow that if it's inconvenient, if it causes some tension, I'm through, or do we have a deep kind of love that, as the scripture says, is patient, is kind, it perseveres, it outlasts, it does not rejoice in evil. <laughs> but rejoices in the truth. Y'all heard about that love, right? First Corinthians chapter 13. Some of y'all are looking at me like, I don't know what you're talking about. Amen. Write down First Corinthians 13. You know that scripture you hear read at every wedding you go to? You don't even know the scripture. You think it's, it's written by Plato or something, you know, Socrates. Oh, that's just so, who them some great words. I'd love to come to a wedding just to hear these words. No, that's the Bible, y'all. Touch your neighbor, amen. First Corinthians 13. Third thing I'll say, travel light. The cloud is telling you and I to travel light. Somebody holler travel light. Travel. Tell your neighbor travel light. Travel. The scripture says to lay aside every weight and the sin. Isn't it interesting that weight and sin don't have to be the same thing? Weight is that thing that weighs you down. It is a heaviness you carry, but it's not necessarily something that is a, 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 a rebellious act against God, which is what sin is. I tell people all the time, just because uh, just because it's not good for you doesn't mean that it's sin. You know, just because you puff puff passing don't mean it's sin. If your puff puff passing becomes a vice that creates addiction issues and 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 self medicating issues, it may not even still be a sin. It may be a weight. Addiction is not a sin. It's a weight. So that's why you have to lay aside the weight and the sin. Now, there's some real sins out here now. Amen. Amen. We talk about the sin within us, the sin around us, the sin beyond us. How I many know there's some sin inside of us that we got to keep attending to? That part of you that, that is always curving its desire inward at the expense of your neighbor, that part of you that is greedy and selfish and hateful and mean, and that part of you, you know, that you, you just fast and pray that it don't ever come out. You know, the incredible hope that's in each and every one of us. <laughs> it's talking about don't make me angry. <laughs> you ain't gonna like me with that. You know, how many got that part in you, man? That's the part that you and I gotta attend to. But you also got to appreciate that the way we attend to our weight and our sin, as the scripture says, is to travel lightly. God, through the power of your spirit, how can I drop some of this stuff off? The reason why we try to make church attendance or Bible studies, small groups, prayer meetings, a rhythm of life is because we are trying to drop some weight and sin off. 
It's like a pit stop on the way to your destination. When I was looking at the Sojourner's movie, uh, uh, Sojourner Truth, you know, Harriet Tubman movie, what was that, Underground? No, it was just called Harriet. Harriet. I, I was so fascinated that along the way she had all these pit stops that she made for herself and others to drop off some of that stink they had gathered. To get a little warm, to get some soup, to get a little encouragement, to make sure you're going in the right direction. How many of you know some of us need to make sure we take advantage of some of these pit stops along the way? Don't you get so caught up in your journey that you don't think you need a pit stop. That you don't think you need to make a little bit of a, of a, of a stop along the way and say, God, how can I drop off some of this weight? Some of this tiredness and this abuse and this disappointment along the way. I'm not going to keep going on my journey without laying aside some weight. I was watching last night uh, 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 Deontay Wilder get his head cracked by Tyson Fury. Boy, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I was stunned. But one of the things I observed about Tyson Fury's strategy is boxing. Some of y'all like, who? What are these names? Wilder Fury, what are, you, what are you talking about? Tyson Fury's 287 pounds, 6'7". Wilder 6'4", 230 pounds. Neither of these folks are small men. But Tyson was so much larger than him that when he and, 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 and Deontay Wilder would, 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 would uh, hold one another, Tyson Fury would put all of his weight on still a pretty big person. But his weight tired this brother out to the point where by the fifth round, plus he, he got hit in the ear and I think it shattered his eardrum. You saw blood just kind of, sorry to be so graphic, but, but you know, yeah, I, I, why was we watching that? I wasn't anticipating that, but it was quite graphic. I was like, Lord have mercy. <laughs> and what happened, this thing, got, this thing got rough quick for that brother. <laughs> Woo. But when his ears shattered, his legs, you watched his equilibrium. He could, he could barely stand. And Tyson put his weight on him. And by the sixth round, his corner threw in the towel. Why? Because too much weight. You can be strong and big, but when you lose your ability to be stable, and when you get too much weight on you, even the strongest person will fall. <laughs> Along the way, I will lay aside some weight. I'm going to come to church to lay aside some weight. I'm going to meet in my small groups to lay aside some weight. I'm going to... Fellowship with some folk who I know have my best interests at heart because I'm trying to lay aside some weight. I'm going to confess and repent because I want to lay aside some sin. I'm going to do what is necessary to take care of myself. Go to therapy. Go on a walk. Do some crafts, some arts. Write a song. Go for a boat ride. I don't know. Lay aside the weight of this Bay Area grind that will have you like Deontay Wilder. Can't stand. Don't know where the where the hits is coming from. My <laughs> brother was stunned. <laughs> I said, throw in the towel. I felt like Rocky, the Rocky movie. Throw the towel. <laughs> and the last thing I'll say, we're gonna pray. You and I must make sure that at the very least we keep running. Yeah. Tell your neighbor, keep running. Y'all know that? Whatever you do, don't stop running. Don't stop moving forward. The scripture says, run the race set before you, looking to Jesus, the pioneer. Jesus is your trailblazer and perfecter. Jesus fix all the things that you leave undone. Amen. If you keep running, Jesus will keep giving you the strength to finish. The race isn't given to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Another verse says, but the one who endures to the end, yeah. 
shall be saved. Keep running. Don't give up because it's hard. The cloud of witnesses are telling you keep running. Run after your family, run after your marriage, run after your degree, run after your children, run after your well-being, run after your health, run after your purpose. Keep running after it. And let the wind of God be the wind beneath your wings. For they that wait on the Lord. And be of good courage. He will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Stand with us, everyone, and let's take a few moments to pray. If you don't mind, grab the hand of the person next to you. Song says, soon as I stop worrying, worrying how the story is, when I let go and I let God, let God have his way. That's when things start happening. When I stop looking at back then. When I let go, when I let go, and I let God, hey, I let God have So real quick, say, let go. Let go. And let God. Let God. Let go. Let go. And let God. Let God. Let go. Let go. And let God. Let God. We want to let it go. Let go. And let God. From the top, soon as I stop. Stop looking at back then. I pray for the person that I'm touching today, God. I pray that, Lord, you would remind them of your great love for them. Remind them, God, that we are a part of a great cloud of witnesses across time and across place, across geography, and even as people who have our ancestry and our heritage and black African traditions, we know, God, that we are not apart from those that have came before. So we celebrate our ancestors. We celebrate our struggle. We believe, Lord God, that just like the biblical text says, that all of us, Lord, receive the promise, not apart from one another. We stand on their shoulders and we want to receive the promises you have laid up, Lord, for our families, our children, our people, our communities. And God, even every people group, Lord God, we are all created in your image. Lord, in your likeness, we all have dignity, human dignity, a shared imago dei, I pray that regardless of our race, our culture, our gender, our orientation, our geography, our nation, God, may the promises that you have made to humanity, to creation, Lord God, may they be realized not apart from one another, but together. May we realize that we can't win if our neighbor is struggling. We can't be better if our neighbor is without. I pray, God, that we will not uh, separate ourselves by these divisions, Lord God, but with great clarity, we will see, God, that we are a part of a great cloud of witnesses. And these witnesses are cheering us on to resist with faith-filled resistance to ensure, Lord God, that we keep running and keep pushing and keep striving for the promises that you have made to us. And we'll say, thank you, Lord. Now lift your hands right where you're standing. It's me, O oh Lord, and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother. It is not my father, my sister, or my brother. But it's me, God, and I need you. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. Say it again, I need you, Lord. 
I need you, God, to give me the strength to keep pushing through this season. May I, Lord God, not see myself weighted down by the sin and the weight that would easily cling to me or get in my way. But may I, God, through faith, keep pushing forward so I can imagine and see in the land of the living the fulfillment of your promise. And we'll say thank you, Lord. Just take a few moments with your hands lifted and just ask the Lord for what you need. Right now, God, I need your joy. I need your peace. I need your hope. I need your healing of my body, my mind, my soul, my spirit. Healing of relationships. Healing, Lord God, on my job, in my family, in my, at my school, Lord God. Do what is necessary to bring wholeness. And we'll say thank you, God, for the cloud that is watching us. May we be faithful. And may we continue to celebrate and live into the best of our people and our history and our heritage. For we are your people and the sheep of your pasture. In Jesus' name we pray. Hug two or three people. Tell them the cloud is watching us. Tell them that as soon as I stop worrying. Tell them that the cloud is watching. Worrying.